ね。Happy Monday, everybody. Yeah! It is a happy Monday. And Indeed woe, it is. woe befall any of those who would deny that fact. <laughs> hey, Justin, it feels like, man, it just feels like it was just the other day you and I were podcasting together. <laughs> I literally, because my flight got delayed, I had to leave <laughs> Friday instead of uh, Thursday. And so I got back. Like just in time for John Teasdale to drive up from uh, San Diego to the Bay Area, we did this Bay Area Book Fair Saturday and Sunday. So Friday we're uh, you know hanging out Bay Area Book Fair Saturday Sunday. Wake up today and at least I'm like, well, like there's certainly been no breaks, but at least I'm back to my normal schedule. <laughs> Holy cow! So you went straight back to work after all of that? Oh yeah. No, slinging these games, slanging these games. But you want to know what? I don't feel like this is work at all. This is me hanging out with my besties. It was a, it was a pretty good time hanging. I, I'm pretty glad your flight got uh, delayed so that we were able oh, to have. Uh, no, at some point we have to, on the night attack, we have to uh, uh, play the Talk video. Talk about our new. Oh, oh, the and, uh, uh, yeah, and also uh, talk about the most controversial movie of the 21st century. Spoiler oh, alert, it was made in the 20th century. Yeah. Oh, God, I can't even. Uh, some, yeah. The, the parts, parts of that, uh, the, anyway, we'll talk. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. How you doing, Andrew? I'm good. I'm good. You tired? Sleepy boy? A little. Yeah. A little. Cool. Uh... Hmm. Well, uh, I think I'm good to go here. I don't know if you guys are also good. Let's dive in. Yeah. Is this uh? Is th this is the fourth weird things we've done in uh, seven days, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's I pretty cool. Technically, yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, are we all? Are we all caught up on? On GOT? Are we gonna? Are we gonna talk any any GOT on the show? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, can I? I <laughs> spoiler alert! I think you know. I I put last night's episode kind of like the Matrix too. You know, like yeah, you could have pushed that into that first one or pushed it into the third one. <laughs> uh, I I actually have a counter take on that. Um, uh, and and I um, from what from the exchange we had last night, I think Bryce does too. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe we can. We can. Uh, yeah. Third act, a little bit of that. Sure. Oh, yeah. I was there was a great thirty minutes there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's true. That's uh, my point. It was it was a felt like thirty minutes spread into you know eight two. Was, it, that was just, that is that is a legit take. That's, really that's what I meant. You could have put it into you know we we're hearing oh we're gonna get these feature length episodes like great it's like like it has it has been a rather tantric final season. <laughs> yeah. I mean. I don't know. At the risk of us just doing <laughs> the Game of Thrones episode right it's now like, instead of, uh, 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 I, I I rather enjoy. If it, if it is tantric, then at least it is doing the things that I enjoy being spread out. Mm -mm. Alrighty. Well, uh, as for the show, uh, let's start the show in right. three, two. 
Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, sirs. Brian Brushwood. That's a true fact. Forget all of you. You Brian Brushwood doesn't exist, truthers. I'm here. And the head of the Brian Brushwood doesn't exist, truthers, <laughs> Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. It is awfully <laughs> convenient that Bryce is uh, the one, you know, behind all the dials and the knobs. And right. also, I'm the invisible hand. He, he's the one assuring everybody that Brian Brushwood is definitely a real person here. Pay no um, attention are, to the man behind the mixer. <laughs> Are you guys familiar with the conspiracy theory that birds aren't real? Sorry, birds? Full birds? stop? I've seen that birds. Birds, did, birds did. aren't real. The birds are uh, either robotic or some like lab-grown government creation for surveillance. Oh. Uh, this is great <laughs> because I, I can't decide if I like this better or worse than the idea that the 1960s rock group, the birds, were not real. But, uh, <laughs> well, but also, but, uh, <laughs> like, a, a, one of the weird conspiracy theories that's solved by roadkill. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah. and I, I'm sure that's part of it because you notice that birds, when they die, they their bodies they go spark. away very, very quickly. Well, it, it, uh. specifically because they have hollow bones, the it, the, the breeze blows them mm. into corners, Nanotubes. and also there, there's there's less mass to consume. So when ants get at it, mm. it's like 20 minutes later, they're gone. So I could kind of understand, like, if all these birds are real, where are all the dead bird bodies? It's me, oh. conspiracy theory, Jerry, uh, uh, Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry, <laughs> geez, uh, who let conspiracy theory Jerry in? Uh, uh, well, I got a theory on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I wound up. Somebody turned me onto that because I owned birds, and uh, they. Uh, uh, so I followed, and then they followed me back. The birds aren't real. Instagram. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and it's all memes, but I don't know whether like it's one of those things. And Andrew, I'm sure that you had a lot of this uh, specifically with like JREF stuff, where you see things where you almost have to assume that they're parody, right? But the second you poke your head in, you very often find out that they are not right. Like that, 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 that somebody believes this. Um, you know that was a funny thing about the flat Earth thing was a while ago. It, it used to be kind of there was some people generally believed it, but there was sort of a flat Earth society that was sort of a joke, and it was just this like, ha ha, isn't it funny if we have a thing called you know, hey, flat Earth. And then, you know, you had conspiracy theorists, and there always had been conspiracy theorists who detached themselves to it. And now, of course, there's a lot of, you know, people who are, you know, basically convinced of this and of all of the, all of the surrounding, you know, silliness that goes with it. So, yeah. You know. uh, anyway, so birds may or may not be real. And uh, you could you could look that look that conspiracy. Oh no, I think somebody turned me on to that when I was doing Conspiracy Week. That they, they were like, I asked everybody their favorite. Like you don't believe it, but you love the fact that other people believe it in in whatever weird way that birds aren't real. <laughs> I don't. Know. I, I think we could come up with just about any kind of a conspiracy that we wanted to at this point. Yeah. All right, what's a what's a fringe conspiracy that you could? you could be convinced of oh man um oh, it's gonna take me a second to access it but there's two or three that i'm sort of on the cusp of um shoot i'm gonna need a moment i i think most of them are like hollywood stuff like uh stuff that was released under some circumstances but the secret behind the reason scenes reasons for it like the more you hear about it you're like oh that does that does track i'm i'm probably like Two documentaries away and one person that I really respect saying that like some level of like Rothschild family, like Bilderberg conference, uh, of higher level like uh, of control of, of economies and governments uh, away. Yeah, I, I could see. Yeah, some of the central banking sort of stuff or whatever, like I could certainly see that like, you know, you you could you could sort of persuade me that like, you know, forget, you know, forget the the Bilderberg and the conference we're aware of, but like, oh yeah, you know, there's another group and if you look at like, you know, who they these all finance ministers went to this, you know, 
school in Eaton or whatever. They're all part of this 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 one economics club sort of thing. And they do talk about this, but it shapes the change of things. Like, I could believe there are nexuses for thoughts on where things come from, politics and stuff. Not it's like, you know, people sitting in basements stroking white cats and stuff. This is yeah. what it's going to be. But there are a little, you know, you have Davos and other stuff. But there are other things, you, you, know, you know, more obscure sort of stuff where you get some of the people who are actually the policymakers for certain things go to and then say, yeah, no, this new fiscal theory makes more sense. So let's use this for establishing bank rates or stuff like I could be like convinced that like there's, you know, little pockets of, you know, these things. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't think it's any kind of like command and control. Like, okay, yeah. uh, there's like charts, and somebody, you know, Doctor Claw bangs his fist on the table, and now all of a sudden, these, you know, a country dissolves or something like that. But uh, I, I do think the idea that there is an upper current of influence is is on one level kind of undeniable. The question is exactly mm -hmm. how impactful it is. I, I went into a Wikipedia hole about a. Bohemian Grove, uh, oh, yeah. uh, which is, for those of you who are unaware, a gathering that I, I think still goes on uh, out here in California, but as specifically in the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s was a very influential place for out, out in the redwoods of California where politicians, like, careers were made. Like, the, the Richard Nixon credits a, a Bohemian Grove meeting where he wound up giving a big speech as kind of the resuscitation of his career past 1960 and, and him running for president again because people the the right people saw him as a leader i have friends that do that the whole bohemian grove thing it's like big it's like <laughs> rich dude summer camp <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's the uh the interesting the interesting thing about it is that it it, it has and even richard nixon on tape had some very pointed language about the kind of people that go to Bohemian Grove and the yeah. activities that they like to uh, engage in out there. But it's, uh, uh, you know, there's no doubt that there are people that are that are making uh, uh, the decisions. And certainly Bohemian Grove itself has spawned a lot of conspiracies. But the question is exactly how much influence they have, how much any one person or one organization can have over a chaotic world. You know. I remember I read a book, early 90s or whatever, and maybe, Brian, we talked about this, The Puzzle Palace, which was about the NSA. And they talked about, like, it was a lot of, like, you know, going into the NSA, and it talked about things like that there was a facility in the United States that had uh, British agents, British, British uh, intelligence agents operated it, and it was used to surveil American communications because it was a way to get around the legalities of Americans, because we passed a law saying, you know, we, you know, our spy agencies can't spy on like domestically. So we had a listening post here that was run by British that we worked with. And then in England, we had a facility where we operated and it was an intelligence sharing thing, but it was a way, a technicality to get around it. And I remember reading this, I get like, this sounds very plausible. This is very plausible. And Puzzle Palace went into the whole thing about like, when Western Union laid down the first telegraph lines, how the Navy we used ships to stop them and say we're going to splice in, you know, listening devices, things like this, and the history of this stuff, and it, just about everything I remember from it turned out to be true, and and that's one of the things that later on when we've heard about domestic spying and a lot of this other stuff, you're it's kind of like, yeah, this is this is not new, and and we've been bending the rules and doing this thing. Not that it should be not to judge it either way, but it's like that was the thing for me was like. If you weren't a nut, but followed what was legitimately like credible. Well, and, and that's the problem, or I guess the wonderful thing about conspiracy theories is that conspiracies are real. They're they're real things. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I think one of my previous picks was Operation Mincemeat, which was a, uh, a collective like it was, it was it was a collaboration of hundreds of individuals to secure a body to create a fake British officer who'd never existed and find a body that looked close enough to it and stuff his pockets with a bunch of fake intel and uh, and to conspire to have the body wash ashore on exactly the right uh, Spanish small town that was sympathetic to the Nazis, but 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 objectively said that they're on the Allies' side, and then to allow the Nazi coroner a few minutes alone with everything so that he could take some pictures of the documents that, that basically lied about where the Normandy invasion was going to happen. Like, 
real big conspiracies do happen. Uh, so as a result, like maybe I'm not crazy to think that women's uh, pants always have small pockets to keep big handbag alive. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or most recently, I do find myself stumbling across the whole Elon Musk, everything is more likely to be a simulation than not, because it's like the mere fact that, I, and I understand the bias, the mere fact that I'm alive and generally healthy and in a good place makes me think, oh, well, if this was a video game and I was an eternal being and I did just want to understand what it was like to be alive in the early 21st century, it does seem like this is the kind of life I would sign up for on my seventh or eighth lap. So maybe it is a big, uh, a big fat simulation. Let's touch. I want to touch on that in a second because your rationale for that's very different than my own. Um, by the way, Operation Mincemeat, that was the book in the movie The Man Who Never Was, but was based upon that story. You know, so if you ever you ever see the movie, it's cool. It's about, you know, and, and that apparently did play a very big part in influencing, you know, where the Nazis decided to put their defenses. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily – I'm not into the whole simulation argument because I think that, like, yay, me, I'm leveling up or whatever. I just – for me, it's like hey, anytime I play a video game or I look at some of this current stuff in AI and all that, I'm like, yeah, this isn't real. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, if this is what we're doing now, I'm like, this isn't real. <laughs> it just wait, wait, sorry, sorry. What what do you mean? You mean your reality isn't real, or or well, the chances I, of being just, a simulation? Every time I see, for me, one of the big things was playing around with some computer, you know, a neural network, you know, on my own little system here. Where it started generating spontaneously generating images that looked like close enough from you know arm's length distance looked like real things right and then looking at some of the procedurally generated stuff where you see uh entire cities generated through uh computer generated stuff not because it's programmed how to do build buildings and stuff but just because of it learns basically how to just spontaneously generate stuff or looking now like you've seen like the 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 new generations of the simulations where you put other people's faces or completely generate humans using, you know, these neural networks and stuff. I'm like, man, like it would be so I could imagine just several steps from where we are now, how easy it would be to convince just a bunch of neurons or convince itself that it's reality is real. And I'm like, then, OK, I, I guess. Probably is a simulation. Oh, so you're you're firmly on the side that 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 we're all simulated beings. Um, I to me, to, to me, it's like. You know, the, the, the going back to the whole, you know, idea of applying sort of the, you know, the Drake equation kind of logic that like if if it's possible to create a billion simulations that are just as real as our world around us and the inhabitants have no idea if they're in a real one or not, what are your chances that you're in the real world one in a billion? Yeah, uh, uh, by that same logic, though, um, I, I, I remember um being a fan of the Drake equation until I read one of uh, Michael Crichton's essays where he points out that that pretty much the entire Drake equation is nothing but prejudices. It is your inherent starting bias of your opinion about how likely oh, life is oh, to evolve I, I, and all yeah, that I'm not stuff. defending the Drake equation, just the basic idea of saying if, if we if we accepted and I, I totally agree. I always had there are too many. So I just meant the idea. If we say, and, and, and by the way, uh, we obviously all know the Drake equation. Right, right. So, so yeah, just just it for for anybody who does it. <laughs> uh, so the the Drake equation is is ostensibly a way to calculate what are the odds uh, of of how much alien life there is out there, and it reads as you know uh, n equals r subprime something times f subprime yeah, sub p. We'll have and sub C, blah, 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 blah. Number Basically, of stars in a galaxy times the number of planets times the number of planets that can support life towards uh, sub developing intelligent life. Like a lot of like very, very long odds multiplied sure. against each okay. other. Okay, all right, I got you. God's but But, but then, uh, I, and, and I think you're right, uh, Andrew, in that, in that we're looking at, if we're going to calculate the odds of this being a simulation, it, it is very much a Drake equation-like situation, but ultimately... The only way for us to fill in those gaps is with our prejudices again. And I remember yeah. the, the the phrase that landed with me was when uh, Michael Crichton said, uh, "An equation that can me that can be anything uh, it means nothing." And uh, sure, and, and yeah, I, the, I feel like we're in the, the same Drake conundrum. Equation, 
it, yeah, it breaks down like we haven't we, we can estimate planets. We can estimate maybe what we think are habitable planets, perhaps. But when you start getting into and then the ones that develop cellular, you know, cellular life. Well, we only have one example of that. And then multicellular, again, only one example of that. And that's where it just sort of the, it could be off by a factor of a billion. <laughs> so that's that's the breakdown of the Drake equation. For me, I just meant the whole idea of like, hey, if you have a billion universes and, nine, you know, w only one's real, the others are all spawned, these virtual ones where everybody inside of it thinks they're real. What If it's simplified like that, if you simplify it like that, and it can be simplified like that, and as far as I know, it could be, I'd be like, I, I guess it's a simulation. I, I Along that same odds, though, like if we were thinking about if it's a simulation or not, like it seems to me like if we were doing a simulation, we'd have more interesting, uh, like 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 if if I'm gonna sign up to be in a simulation, it's gonna be one. It's gonna be like a Star Trek universe where there's tons well, of you, other aliens you, and all this stuff. You're you're coming from the point of view from your in your idea that you that that uh, one that I'm a person outside the simulation who signed up for this, and I'm not just. <laughs> you know, non-player character. I mean, my, and my <laughs> idea is like, I'm an NPC. I'm just, you know, and it, it might even be, I don't even assume it's necessarily a game. It could be just, somebody's just trying to calculate the thermodynamics of, you know, gas exchange on some planet around Sirius, you know, like, and we're just a byproduct. I mean, like, literally, I'm living my entire life to, have, at some point, answer uh, somebody important, I hear the king has a new advisor. And that's it. <laughs> That's the entire point of my life. Oh, oh, yeah. oh to be a non-player character. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, my whole purpose is like, ah, would you like to see some ledger domain, sir? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I was I was saying like, what well, what would be the uh, in in you know imagining and, and 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 applying you know grossly applying anthropomorphizing whoever will create the simulation like yeah what's the value of a bunch of these simulations you know like yeah if they're super advanced and stuff it's not like they're like wow that wagon wheel's amazing we're gonna use that in our in our flying cars but it might be like oh you know man their version of Infinity War is much better than ours. Let's watch that. You know, their version of this TV show is really damn good. I like that. I like this music. You see Eminem's album in Universe XCC333101? Fantastic. So, or it could be a means to, like, recreate history, right? Like, sure. Uh, in the world where, uh, you know, maybe information is gone. And we see that in this simulation where, in, you know, information sort of degrades over time. Uh, it would not be the craziest thing to say, well, let's put all the raw ingredients back in and get the VCR, the, the VHS tape out. <laughs> yeah. I I don't know. I, but it is interesting. We, and again, we, every one of our points of view is as valid as the other as far as what it could be. You know, it's kind of what I like about the discussion. You're like, why? Well, I think it's because of this. I don't know. Hmm. I just don't believe anything, especially birds. <laughs> well, even if you are just uh, binary patterns being spat out by an ultimately powerful computer, you can still give your credits to us at patreon.com slash weird things. Again, patreon.com slash weird things is where you can support the show. Thank you to everybody who has already done it. Of course, the beginning of the month is always a time that we like to give thanks to those who have kicked in a little scratch to keep this show a rolling. Go ahead and check it out. Patreon.com slash weird things. Mm -hmm. So on a related subject, we talked about before, and it was just mentioned in the chat room, uh, the idea of uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks. That's where you have like a random noise generator on one end, and then you have uh, something that's trying to recognize the images on the other, and it scores. And it says, yeah, no, that's good. And so the noise generator starts to be less random and starts to generate things that satisfy that other processor, right? Well, some scientists, being the crazy people that they are, said instead of like having that be a computer processor recognizing images on the other end, what if we put some electrodes on a monkey brain and we show a bunch of images to a monkey and every time we get a much bigger feedback, like the recognition centers flare up, we tell that generator like, yeah, you're doing good. More of this, more of this. Well, they did it. And they created images that were basically the monkey's brain working with the neural network started generating images that made the monkeys go, hmm, I like this. This is very cool. Please show me more. And <laughs> So the idea is that by by reacting to the synapses in the monkey's brain, that 
these represent ideal mental images for monkeys? Is that the it, idea it's here? Basically, the computer is trying. It starts trying to randomize and trying to create generate artificial images until it starts creating images that the monkey brain starts to recognize or starts to like. You know, the more neurons fire, going like, "Oh, I like this," or "I understand what this is." Mm -hmm. So these are completely computer generated images, just starting with random pixels until the feedback for the monkey's brain says, yeah, this looks like some this looks like something. So these are images the monkey's brain goes, yeah, I think that's something. I like it. Oh, just and, and, and from, from there, it would keep going more in that direction based on each time the monkey thought that he saw something that he liked. Yeah. Now, on the right, they show you these natural images or images they show the monkeys or the monkeys liked. And it's kind of sad because the upper row is just monkeys. And then the lower rows, you realize what their life is like because it's just it's humans with masks on. <laughs> <laughs> but then these images on the left are the ones that the machine learning generated. Yeah, it looks yeah. like you got something that vaguely resembles a rooster in the upper right hand corner. The other one looks like a kind of like a husky like dog. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, it seems like it likes dogs. The bottom one here well, looks like the face masks that the scientists in the wear. Upper, the upper ones, like though, yes, but they could also, if you start to look, you start to see the dots and stuff, and sort of the similar patterns to the images on the right. Mm -hmm. You you see what kind of looks like, you know. Maybe because like like the, the the upper left one, the left half looks kind of like a monkey face. Yeah, yeah. Anything anything with uh, fur and a eyeball, uh, I feel yeah. like the monkey's gonna be like, oh, that's me, it me. <laughs> but look on the lower in the middle section, the one on the right, that looks like you realize that there. If the monkeys, all the humans, the monkeys see are people with blue blue hair caps, and blue yeah. smocks and white face masks. You realize that's oh probably what they're that's why it got triggered like oh it means banana time or something because of the coloring not necessarily yeah. the form or wow so how did it uh, did it just uh, i guess they had brain monitoring equipment and then they just showed all of these images and paid attention to which ones it it, it seemed to go ooh to they it's started with basically started with random pixels mm -hmm. and then every time they got a higher score they would say okay keep clustering these pixels here or use this color here and every time that score there was a feedback loop and it, it basically over time that image grew from the response from the monkey's brain until you know you basically started from just random noise and you end up with basically something that looks kind of like an image like an optometrist better one better two yeah yep, yep yeah. exactly Oh. And that's the way, like, you know, if you've seen the GANs where they've used them to generate, like, human faces, it's the same thing. Is they, they basically, um, but on the one making the decisions is another piece of software that's that's trained to recognize faces. Yeah. And here they're just saying, well, let's just look at a monkey's brain and see if the monkey, you know, seems to recognize it. Uh, I was showing this one on the, on the video earlier, but there's a new GANs out um, that generates, like, fashion models. Have you guys seen uh -huh. this? It generates a full body, so an, an outfit plus you know the human face and head and hair, and then so we're look. Uh, yeah, we're looking at basically it looks like people and clothing, posing and all that, and they're completely generated. When we say generated, we don't mean it's like a three D model of a person that it's just adding clothes or faces to. It's doing the same thing before. It started with a bunch of random points until the generator says person not a person, person not a person. This one's generating people and clothing and full bodies. Totally won't be used for porn. Don't worry. It won't be used for porn at all. Oh, gosh. Wow. It's over for you, human uh, coat hangers. Uh, <laughs> yep. They're going They're going full uh, AI there. Uh, that's amazing. That's insane. Especially this part in the video where, like, they are able to sync up the poses. So it can, I mean, it seems like it's actually deterministic about it, about, like, generating not just a, like, not just the goal of generate a model, but also like generate a model in this pose. It seems really mm -hmm. capable of that. Wow. So I wonder what is the because uh, Bryce, you brought this uh, to our attention a few weeks ago. The uh, the the metal station that is just like playing uh, a computer AI generated metal from right. this one band uh, in a couple weeks on on our bank episode. Yeah. Oh, I mean. We uh, will in the be future. talking about it. Uh, <laughs> new conspiracy <laughs> theory. Justin teleported from the future. <laughs> hey Bryce, you know what you should do is show us some like stuff using a heavy metal band using <laughs> neural networks. Yeah, do so, new that. Please, in the next few weeks, figure that out. Sure. But uh, 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 and then also figure out that uh, at some point the band comes back and curates it. I wonder what the curation process for something like that is. Like, oh, do man. you just make? 
the like Sears catalog of the best versions of these things. And then even beyond that, could you just source all that stuff from China and just actually sell it on Instagram? Like, uh, uh, is this a fully, could you totally run the Sears operation off your phone? Like if you're just watching that and picking through uh, the best things that you like. Um, se separate side jag in a similar vein. Uh, you know, all of this is being developed for um, virtualizing producers, right? So it's like you've got uh, low fidelity AI uh, producers that's creating fairly raw content. But the consumers we tend to only think of as, as human beings. Have we explored the idea of why we might have robotic consumers and what that might be like, like um, I, in in what for what outcome I guess uh, uh, for for uh, to to give people work uh, like uh, imagine a future where uh, you know we're we're in a universal basic in income kind of society and people are noticing that it's like wow a lot of people are producing stuff and nobody's buying it and mm -hmm. they're not making money but meanwhile they're going through all the creative work to create stuff uh, maybe we could finance a set of uh, AI bots that will buy stuff and, and they become educated, um, I, I, I self, uh, directed consumers like, and, and what happens once, once AIs are, their job is to consume stuff. And, and what does that look like? So I've thought about this, Brian, I think it's a very interesting thought. The question is one in the early stage though is like as long as somebody owns the bots then it's the same thing as Amazon buying your stuff up. But yeah, if we get to the point where we have they're they're intelligent and they have their own rights and their own abilities to own their own bank accounts and make their own choices and stuff, it's crazy like yeah, you know, you, we could be we could have an economy where it's trillions of bots to, you know, a few billion people. And it it sounds we we talked about this on the show oh, in a few months at least back, but uh, the Google sort of selfish ledger idea of like yeah, yeah. An, an AI tapping into all of the information in your day to day life and buying not just buying but designing and manufacturing uh, tailor made goods for you. Like if it knew you wanted a scale, it would design the scale that you would want uh, and then buy it for you. Uh, I, I could see a functional version of that, of, like, bots proactively buying stuff. I don't know that bots having money and then just giving the money for some reason. Well, think but about think about what we do on YouTube right now. Like, uh, Google has gotten much, much better about explaining what it is. The, they're getting closer to revealing uh, how the YouTube algorithm works to, to boost stuff up. And it gives you, it says, look, I don't know what your widgets are that you make on YouTube, but in general, your last 10 episodes, they tend to perform this well. And based on that, if it's doing better than that, then we'll push it out to more people and see what happens. But it occurs to me that there's enough distance between us and the art we create and the consumers who are actually watching it that if you told me, yeah, uh, fully 50% of those are bots whose job is to watch content and they we've artificially trained the bots to become extremely good critics of what is good and bad entertainment. And we realize that it enhances the overall ecosystem to have bots watching your stuff. So all I know is that we get a certain paycheck based on a certain number of people watching it. And I can conceive of some esoteric reason that uh, uh, Google would, would, you know, unleash a hundred thousand view bots to go out and watch content and decide what's good and bad and provide the social proof of just being there. And then it, the conundrum it puts in my mind is do I care if the check clears the same either way, whether it's robots watching my stuff and robots commenting and robots sending emails and eventually robots buying our merchandise, do I care if it's a human or a robot on the other end? You you may not, but the advertisers were the ultimate source behind that check would. And I guess that's yeah. where it comes back to. Is... Sure. And and let's say, and because this is like, a fantasy is a, scenario, a let's, say, transaction? Uh, let's say, let's say they have realized that, that having this, bot based ecosystem adds, uh, let's say, you know, if it's a quadrillion dollars to the ecosystem, it, it, it increases it by 25%. So it's like, well, yes, we will spend $5 billion on these bots because they're adding 
uh, uh, twenty five billion dollars or two hundred and fifty billion dollars to the overall uh, uh, economy of of this and and uh, driving people to quality faster. Help me understand, like, okay, because how is your scenario different than just right now an algorithm already that sorts and says, well, we'll sort them because this out this gets higher views and that means because the 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 driver of YouTube is advertiser dollars, right? And so we have algorithms now that say. Put Brian here. Modern. This algorithm says, "Oh, we love Modern Rogue. Put it higher because w- more people." It's a bot saying, "I'm voting this higher because the advertising dollars will mean more here." So, uh, uh, this is just off the top of my head. So, forgive me if it's not very good uh, proposal. But imagine there's a competitor to YouTube, and all of the best and brightest of YouTube, or, or in fact, let's let's put all this in the competitive com- competing ecosystem. Let's say a competitor to YouTube comes up and says. Okay, the flight to quality that we've seen in YouTube is directly attributable to the number of entities who are engaging in the curation process and upvoting, downvoting, and all that stuff. We have all so so we're launching a competitor to YouTube, but where we're going to win is that instead of taking the 13 years or 15 years that YouTube's taken to get to this point, we are going to fill it with so many bots that are going to be curating in in competing we're going to create that ecosystem so we're going to have a faster flight to to quality than youtube did and it will be driven because uh, humanity itself only has so many people who care enough to post comments and suggestions and upvote and downvote and drive that flight to quality so what we're going to do is we're going to spend an awful lot of money because we want to take on youtube and we'll fuel it mainly by bots so I think uh, stop me if I'm if I'm misinterpreting, but that the idea would be, while YouTube has an algorithm that is based on critical mass of people watching, that the competitor would say, "All right, we're just going to model statistically relevant, uh, 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 you know, the, the audience that YouTube has, and that that's how we are going to uh, build our community." Correct. Because so. We will so- have- uh, yeah, uh, let, let's say the theory it was uh, YouTube has achieved this level of fidelity over 15 years by virtue of the fact that it has 1 billion human curation units that by virtue of their feedback, their 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 thumbs up, thumbs downs have shaped the quality of content that's coming out. Uh, we perceive that if we can have 5 billion of those units doing the same thing, we will uh, eventually overtake the quality of YouTube because we'll getting we'll be getting faster feedback because we'll be manufacturing the 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 uh, the appreciation engine that uh, that that caused YouTube to be what it is. So if that's the case, uh, then all of a sudden you populate. You know, let's say let's say there's a uh, hundred million real users, but then there's uh, three billion AI users, and let's say give or take for the purposes of exchanges on YouTube you essentially they all pass the the Turing test they all you know they, they all jump in and say first but they say so at exactly a believable amount of time and stuff so and and so their theory is and again maybe this is an incorrect theory you could say it's a bad business model but i can at least picture it happening and i could picture myself being in the position of how much do i care whether the views come from real human beings or bots if in every way they deliver the same thing, including revenue checks based on number of views, uh, meaningful feedback in the comments, uh, 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 you know, and again, I'm starting with that point and then expanding it to, you know, they eventually start writing fan letters and they eventually start spending money on the merch store, all of which for in this imaginary ceremony, uh, uh, situation uh, uh, for the purposes of, of beating YouTube in a race to uh, high fidelity content. So I, I, I certainly think that like those are very interesting ways to try to improve quality recommendations, stuff like that. I guess I keep I guess the thing I'm my my brain is having trouble to sort of detach from is just I see YouTube as it's a platform to deliver advertisement. It, it's advertisers pay money because we want people to buy our products. And that's that's the that's the source of the ecosystem is the advertiser money. And so as an advertiser, I go, OK. How do I benefit from this system? Now, you could say, okay, well, it's going to be better programming. So when your ads do run, I'm like, okay. But that's the end of the day is like, are the av- if it's whatever algorithm, whatever system you want to use to figure out how we show this, great. But your revenue is dependent upon how much stuff you sell. 
I, I think you're getting lost in the weeds on this because um, I'm not saying that it's a good idea. I'm more interested in, as a creator, should I care whether it's humans or robots that are consuming my content as long as the check clears and I get the feedback I want? Uh, there's no shortage of, of definitely tangible examples of people who did bad ideas. Vessel was a bad idea. Vessel was, what if we could cause YouTube to be one week behind us by spending a ton of money? It was a bad idea from the beginning, and that's why it's failed. So imagine Vessel 2.0 is we're going to populate all of the, the this with with robots giving meaningful feedback so so again rather than getting lost in the weeds of whether or not somebody would make this company because we've already seen bad companies get made with bad uh, ideas i'm more interested in as a creator how much does it matter to you where uh, who ultimately sees the stuff and whether they're silicon or or organic well can you explain uh, on your feelings on that idea because i think we spent a lot of time setting up the why but if you want to talk about the receiving end of that are you are, are you inherently into that idea or? i mean I, I i don't know that, that that's why i'm asking you guys what you what you would think of I, that kind of situation I, I think that i think yeah if you if you whatever the business model is we don't have to worry about it but you as a creator i think that anytime you get positive reinforcement somebody says we like what you did or the machine likes what you did or you scored high we like that how much you know and, and we get a lot of fake versions of that we get amplified versions of that on social media you know it, it's it doesn't mean anything to you until you get it and then you go oh cool or you, you got a gold ring you got this and i think video games are a great example of the arbitrary awards or awards tangibly related to effort showing us that we like it so yeah i i i could and again i wasn't trying to like ah so i'm just saying i was trying to just be on the forgetting the economic side of that as a creator or somebody involved in the ecosystem we sure yes a thousand percent yeah i mean if the if the supposition is that those views are counted as legitimate and counted in the same revenue way then i guess it doesn't really change anything i don't know i mean i it's say like i as an author I'm, you know, I have to deal with algorithms all the time. When I see the algorithms have selected me and, and the, the the index is great, and I get a higher profile for my books and stuff, like I've had like the, I've had like the number one book in science fiction for months because of you know cross selections and stuff, and the algorithm liking me, and and it's an artificial, it's a purely artificial thing, but to me it's cool. Well, I, I guess because it, it controls the exposure. Right. And, yeah. and for, for, for Brian, he's like, well, look, if, if long as the money comes in and I'm getting the responses that I want, it's making my content better that I, like, you're not depriving yourself or being led astray by bad or loaded feedback, then what's the diff? I mean, I guess yeah. I guess if, if like that, that would be the thing I would worry about, whether it's a bot or an algorithm saying your video or your content is similar to this other stuff that works well i would worry about the homogenizing even if even if these are the perfect algorithms or, or bots i would worry about the homogenization of content of oh this looks like the other thing that looks really good so let's do that when a lot of the best stuff that we find is new and different from what is already popular well what? bots could look for that uh, so so imagine this uh, to keep it in the literary world imagine borders wants to stage a comeback and they've got a trillion dollars of dark money and they and they want to exact a 10-year campaign then I can picture in a fantasy scenario them uh, activating malicious consumer bots whose job is to do nothing but corrupt your talent and divert it into a place that would not appeal to real humans but instead only appeals to bots so like for example your next book is a bestseller and uh it's about something that you like but everybody is obsessed where it's like man that robot clown was the best thing in the entire thing man if only that robot clown should have his own spin-off series and you're just getting tons of feedback from that and so it's like so next year you decide well i'll try a one-off of the robot clown saga and uh and sure enough it becomes an instant bestseller it's one of the biggest things you've ever done and then three years later you're like everyone's like oh you know what uh, uh the, the 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 sexual tension between robot clown and satellite man uh is just great that should be a thing and then you find yourself going farther and farther away like um 
uh, I, I feel like in a word, like we just talked about the ridiculous all, all nature of roads lead to robo hentai, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden you find yourself 10 years in and you're the robo hentai guy. And it was all. And then meanwhile, uh, uh, let's say separately, they're, they're curating their own, you know, uh, uh, separate like, part. This is like, like a bizarre, like, uh, AI version of old boy. <laughs> Eventually you just find yourself being pushed into this disgusting scenario. <laughs> Well, but I mean, I, I guess that that's my question is, and along the way, all the checks are clearing, all the feedback seems genuine. It's just all bot driven. And then uh, I, I guess the one worry at that point is that somebody could switch off the bots and then all of a sudden you're just the robo hentai guy <laughs> and you have nothing to show for it. Who's benefiting from that extra influx of the, uh, uh, cash? Borders, baby. Borders. Yeah, Borders. we spent a trillion dollars in dark what? money to make Andrew the robo hentai guy. Exactly. Like, like in this case, that, and, it wouldn't take and to that be honest, much at all. That's, well, you know, we... We've seen examples, granular examples of this. Like you take you take back in the day AdWords and AdSense, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, if I write about methylesioma or if I write about you know these these diseases associated with really huge litigation and stuff, um, I'm going to do a blog about like you know you know doing you know in suing your insurance company when your loved one dies because we know those payouts are a hundred thousand dollars and the the, the click-throughs that you look you used to be able to search through click-throughs to see like what were the highest paid click-throughs and there were like some that were like thirty dollars and forty dollars or whatever and so people started creating sites for this then other people were like well how i can just take scrape the web for articles that relate to this and create entire sites their whole purpose was just to serve up these articles with this and then you find out that there were other third parties that were making money through click throughs that were creating bots that were clicking on those ads and it was you know that was like google had to fight was you know bots creating content bots clicking on content because of just you know, an artificial network of content, you know. And and I'll tell you what, now that I'm thinking about it, we might have close to a, a real example, because uh, 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 again, this is a new idea I'm having, but like in the war between Vive uh, and Oculus, Oculus has written hundreds of millions of dollars of checks only to keep people with their content exclusive to Oculus. And that's generated some bad publicity for Oculus. In, in a world where they've, spent you know let's let's call it billions of dollars just to try to keep the vibe from overcoming them i could totally see them taking that same billions of dollars and creating robo consumers that just make sure that all the most popular vive content is always garbage to humans so generating uh, junk content no, no 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 buying junk content and encouraging people to increasingly make their stuff garbage where it's like uh, imagine ai bots that are saying like well i mean i like this whole star wars thing but lose the license am i right gross and then and then meanwhile this exact knockoff of the same thing only with like uh let's say donkey penises all over the place uh is like consistently outselling the 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 star wars license and then what does that tell the creators is like well i guess i'm gonna put more donkey penises in my in my vr like i i you know it seems like that would be just as effective as paying for exclusivity yeah i think you could if you you put a dollar amount to say how much if we can spend this little amount and create and influence it because we know they're going to be planning what games do for the next year and really you know and i think that that kind of thing sort of probably precedence there are precedents for that you know another tactic that's interesting is you heard what people will do on amazon to their competitors which is you hire a review farm to give your review your competitor five star reviews a ton of five star reviews. Oh, tons Love of five star obviously reviews. Obviously fake ah. reviews. And then they get flagged by Amazon because who who else would pay for all these five star reviews except for you? Mm -hmm. Your your band. It's like no, I I, I did it, but you we, know we talked about this on on Night Attack before because we get a lot of spam <laughs> um, emails to our account and we don't have a spam filter, um, <laughs> and. Uh, it uh, it was like an an anti SEO tactic like that of like hey pay us money and we will target your competitor with yep. all these like it it's it's weaponized what used to be an easy tool to to gain the system now as a destructive force uh, against your your opponents and that and that's the thing is in in some of those heavily commoditized markets uh, getting targeted like that and being taken down for a day like those are real that's real money that's yeah, catastrophic if, yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, and that's why you know amazon actually just put in this system 
where for copyright, because this is another thing, is that people will just like uh, put up your product. They'll find a version of your product in China and just list it exactly the same that you theoretically would have a copyright challenge on. Amazon now has a program where you can basically like put up a couple hundred dollars in like, I bet you I'm right money. Uh, then the people that you are uh, uh, challenging have the option that they can match that I bet you I'm right money. Uh, and if they don't, then their product immediately gets taken down. Uh, and if they both do match, then it goes to an arbitrator that determines who is actually right. But it's it's Amazon's weird way of trying to say like, all right, well, if there are these abuses, let's figure out a way that through the market, uh, uh, it would be unlikely that somebody who's just a ripoff artist wouldn't just run away from trying to challenge it. Uh, they would rather just say, all right, well, took my shot. Now I can not do that because so many of these places don't even hold their own product. So I, it's interesting. I wish, wish YouTube did that with takedown notices. I, cause like, uh, remember that period of time, like I was getting like dozens of these things that were BS, you know, yeah. ones. Oh God. Yeah. You know, we were talking about this on DTNS, uh, last week that, you know, just talking, the EFF wrote a great article about how broken content moderation is in general, but YouTube is, is obviously a very pernicious one. And we just had another round of people being, uh, you know, uh, taken off of various platforms. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, very, very important conversations that I think are are happening around this right now. But part of what the YouTube thing is, is like, number one, what their recommendation was, is like, you need to be very clear about what you're taking off. And and if you're going into emergency mode, like uh, what they did with the, the New Zealand shooter, then you need to be clear about what you are taking down. These are the things that are getting taken down immediately, and we are doing this now, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see whether or not there's a point where we will not do this. Uh, but if you are going to upload commentary, then here's what we recommend you do as terms of uh, best practices. But furthermore, I kind of wish that we had a point where at least number one, you know, we, we have like our friend Mikey Newman who does the movies with Mikey, and he'll constantly within the first 72 hours face – uh, copyright claims because uh, the the movies that he's talking about, the studios will just have these auto flags that oftentimes don't uh, wind up holding up. The studios usually understand that this is a benefit to them to uh, to have people talking about their movies in glowing terms. But, uh, you know, just to have some kind of window of like, hey, look, if you're a creator, you have 72 hours from when you upload. Just keep an eye on your email or keep an eye on your, uh, uh, you know, YouTube messages. And, uh, uh th that is the period in which we will be very quickly kind of coming back to you based on our bots that are scanning all this kind of stuff that a copyright challenge is going to come in and past that you're going to have at least a, a fair amount of time to challenge anything. But like if for it to get pulled down immediately, just keep an eye on there. And at least that puts, the balance of responsibility on the creator to be like, okay, well, let me, at least I know I, that I need to do this uh, for a period of time instead of just constantly being on edge that anything can get ripped down mm -hmm. immediately and now you're losing those views and specifically at the beginning mm -hmm. that you're, you're going to lose that momentum that all of a sudden there's going to be some element of it that you got to, that it you do have to go to the mattresses on and it's going to have to get taken down and now all the momentum that you built up in that first that crucial first 48 hours is going to be lost. And that's like death in the YouTube world. I remember a few years back, maybe maybe longer, that because this was a big deal for, for gaming on YouTube. Yeah, gaming is one of the largest you know subsections of YouTube uh, where YouTube was, was actually being proactive about this and saying, hey, we're actually going to start a fund because uh, uh, game developers should not be able to use the DMCA system to uh, take down criticism of 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 these games right you had uh uh, uh games co journalists and, and people like jim sterling who would get taken down because some some you know small indie developer uh did not like that uh, there was a bad review out there or a very critical review and was was abusing the dmca system and at one point google uh, google or youtube said we're actually going to put a fund together to protect these creators 
and it's crazy that that I guess didn't I, I haven't heard much about that since but I I would like to think that given how popular entertainment is and how like especially in the case of Mikey who like is very clearly doing criticism and, and fair use usage um, that that type of creator can't have some sort of have more basic protections. I think just rules like literally just having rules of the road that everybody understands that aren't going to be changed overnight. The, the, the problem I, I, is, I would say like in YouTube's case is YouTube is always going to side with Paramount because Paramount spends millions of dollars on and that's why there are tools available to people like them that are not really yes. available to the rest of us mm -hmm. and that was part of the problem is i had i i've had i remember like people were putting my magic videos in their entirety up and i kept repeatedly have to say no this is mine and how many i don't the amount of hours amount of times i spent wasted that because well i'm a little guy and i don't get to use their copyright system to do this but i think that getting the FF or somebody and having them funded or willing to say, let's, let's start suing over false or, ex, you know, of these DMCA notices. Let's make a pen. There's no penalty really to this no. for doing these, you know, and if you don't like it, you can do it and you can harass. And if, as long as there's no penalty for doing it, why would you stop doing it? Asking YouTube or Facebook to enforce that when the biggest provider of these DMCA notices, yeah, you yeah. know, is their advertisers. And there are supposed to be parts of the DMCA for, handle you're supposed to be able to take action against people who misuse it and yeah. we don't see we don't really see that in any substantial way you yeah. have to be able to afford to take action mm -hmm. there's a there's some other weird uh and i guess i guess headline uh, uh shocking uh youtube's takedown system not perfect uh but but there are some weird pockets that happen that that cripple like there is no way to handle it for example uh when you do a performance on penn and tellers fool us uh, to their credit, because they're awesome, they make sure to put a provision in the contract that explicitly gives you the right mm -hmm. to put up uh, uh, enough of your performance on your channel uh, to use as a personal demo reel. Um, I guess some company out there has figured out that everybody is going on Penn and Teller Fool Us, and then they're putting their performance on their channel, and then these guys run around and, and claim all of them. Now, they are not the CW. They are not the production company that owns it. They are a third party, but there is no way to correct it within the YouTube ecosystem because the only way to push back is to say, no, this is 100% my content that I own. And of course, that's not the case. It right. is it is not your content, but but you do have explicit permission in the contract to feature it on, uh, you know, for, for your self-promotion uh, uh, rights. And that puts you in the position of saying, I have the right to show their content, but it's not even that. It's saying, they don't own that content. Exactly. Right. So meanwhile, they're, this third they're, they're party... uploading it on their own site and they are are saying like they're trying to kill the competition by saying, nope, that's our content. I don't even right. know that they're uploading it on their site. I, I think that they are just flat out running around saying if it's a Penn and Teller show, they're saying we own it. And because it happens quietly, they start running ads on all that. Like to, right now, if you type in Brian Brush with Penn and Teller Foolish, you're going to see an ad and, and I will not get any of the money from the ad. The CW will not get any money from that ad. It will be whoever this third party squatter is that has figured out that because the CW does not go around yanking everybody's Penn and Teller Fool Us performances yeah, yeah. off right. because it's in the contract that, that, that you're allowed to show it. But meanwhile, these other guys have figured out that the only way to stop them from running ads on there is to claim that you own it, which would, of course, would be disingenuous and, and fraudulent. Right. And and I know, I, may, I, I think these policies have changed in the past few years, but it used to be if someone was claiming your content and making money off of it, even if that claim was incorrect, that money would not come back to you in the end. Correct. Um, I think that might have changed, but I'd, uh, it's, it's a Byzantine system, right? It's three different Google systems all converging into one train wreck of, of lack of accountability. And, and it's tough because I find myself uh, kind of caught in the middle because on the one hand, I'm super frustrated with where we are, but also... Man, I remember the landscape uh, uh, 11 years ago. Uh, it is it is a miracle that we are where we are now in terms of, of having taken leaps and bounds closer to fairness in mm -hmm. this whole thing. Yeah. You know, you, you might be within your legal rights, though, to say that you are the owner of it because the, the performance itself, you are the owner of. You own the Panamine. You have the copyright on that because of the copyright production for Panamine works. 
So it'd be an interesting because you say, yeah, I own this. I own this, you know, and, and you could say, well, who owns the footage? It's like, well, we're not debating who owns the technical footage, but the performance itself belongs to you because you do. You created it. So um, that's interesting. Possibly. But the yeah. the the tough thing about DMCA is like, you know, YouTube system is is mushy, right? You have to stay file a claim and then YouTube takes yep. action and then you file a counterclaim, but it's not a real DMCA counterclaim because a real DMCA counterclaim takes place in court. So you do a yep. like a phony, no, I'm actually good, and then they decide whether that's right or wrong. And then yep. at that point it becomes the real DMCA process where you gotta get a lawyer, you are actually going to court, there are very real uh, uh legal you know, legal costs and legal uh uh repercussions you know robo lawyers yep. who's gonna be the first, who's gonna be the first uh, uh, uh place to set up a, a, a cyber court where bot lawyers do bot things that that's already a thing isn't it to like fight your aren't there bots that'll fight your tickets for you 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 just go to a website and, and i mean yeah the I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll file the stuff that is that is there but yeah yo i, I would love to see that for uh, uh for DMCA, some of this yeah kind of yeah to level out the playing field right you know here's the issue uh, and actually, actually, my number one topic we'll put it to another week was actually justice reform was going to get into some aspects of that. But, uh, you know, the, in in many I don't know if we really want I think if you're if you're innocent, you probably want a robot arbiter. If you're not, you really don't <laughs> want one. Hmm. You know, that's um, might be part of an issue. But anyhow, you guys want to do picks? Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Hey, look, uh, uh, I'm here to be a trailblazer. <laughs> <laughs> In a few weeks, I'll bet you everyone's going to catch up and tell you about this amazing new sketch comedy show yes! on Netflix called uh, uh, I Think You Should Leave. Uh, I will say I have three episodes left to go, but the first episode is 15 minutes. It's called, uh, has this ever happened to you? It might be one of the funniest 15 minutes I have seen in sketch comedy uh, in in years. Uh, uh, the, the rest of the show is very funny. It's got its, it's, got its uh, 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 high points and, and it's more middling points. But uh, man, that first episode, oh my God. That first it, 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 it does, in my opinion, lose a little bit of steam on that last sketch, but the first five minutes of this mm -hmm. thing is the most powerful opening five minutes of any comedy thing I've seen since the first like, five minutes of yeah. Tenacious D and the Pick of Day's Destiny, uh, which, by the way, also slows down considerably. But but the first five minutes was amazing. <laughs> gasping, gasping for breath. Uh, uh, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, just the first... Like, the, yeah, it goes to that last sketch, and that last sketch is a little bit of a longer thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything up to there. Have the you, baby, have you the got the baby thing? The baby, oh, concept, dude. baby of the year <laughs> is something that I can't, like, it's just so insanely bizarre. I just love every escalation and complication of it. Have have you gotten to the um the Friday night song yet? I keep yes, so, that was the last that was the last <laughs> the last I keep, episode I saw. That keeps coming back in my Friday night. <laughs> I'm thinking Oh my god. <laughs> That's the one at the funeral? The funeral, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so good. It's just it's if I were to to trace it, it is uh of uh, you know very much in the bizarre sense of of uh, some of the Tim and Eric stuff, but it it also has a very weird, like mix of, uh, mature observational comedy with this like very, very repetitive and juvenile at times streaks. <laughs> like it's it's so it's it's pretty good. Uh, if, if you like sketch comedy, it's certain it, it is a must watch if you like sketch comedy. If you don't like sketch comedy, just there's 15 minutes for you that'll that'll hopefully make you laugh if you like a show like this. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, uh, your friend of mine, uh, Rex Williams of the Whiskey Tribe, uh, he's the one that that one of the people who insisted I give it a try, and then uh, said if I didn't like it, uh, he, he could eat the receipt. Uh, the, the he uh, uh, I I was surprised to find out that as much as he loved it, he said he had done like three full laps of it. 
and didn't realize it was directed by the same people who did the uh, big sexy Valentine's Day special, sure, the Michael Kiva. Bolton thing, and uh, uh, so I found myself like having to force feed him a couple of sketches on there for him to see, like, oh, there's more of this. Well, well, also uh, uh, those uh, 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 the, the the main dude. Uh, and his uh, and and the guy who hosts Baby of the Year uh, have a show called uh, Detroiters that went two seasons on Comedy Central that I'd always heard people rave about, but I never gave a shot because I think it, it it sort of fell into the glut of like Always Sunny in Philadelphia and workaholics, and I think it wound up coming off as a uh, a, a sub ran. Of that. Uh, but uh, I, I it's a must watch now after. Uh, I think you should leave. Mm -mm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, I see you in the chat is asking if it's on par with the Mo Michael Bolton special better. I can't believe I'm saying that. Like, like uh, Michael Bolton special was amazing. There's, there's a few mm. minutes of it being a little bit slow. There's no minutes of anything being slow in it's this show. First episode. Like, look, uh, the, the rest of it, if, if you like the first episode, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, but I, I think that that first episode is just, ah, oh, man. So I was we, so we I was I recommended this on Court Killers a few weeks back. And uh, when we do the lineup for the show, I like to find a clip to have while it's playing. And they put up the full clip of the horse ranch. Oh, uh, yeah. Sketch, <laughs> which was my first time seeing that sketch. So I was in this room just shouting. Oh, my God. <laughs> the things that happened in that sketch happen. It's it's so good. It's really, really good. <sighs> Uh, hey, I got a, I got a retro pick. Mm -hmm. uh, I introduced, uh, I knew this moment would have to come sooner or later. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how it was going to go. I didn't know how I was going to set it up. But I explained to my kids, I was like, uh, hey, I think it's time for you to watch this movie. And they're like, uh, okay, well, what's it about? And I'm like, I don't think I'm going to tell you. All I'm going to tell you is that it's very, very weird. And she's like, okay. And I'm like, well, it's, it's kind of part satire against a, a, a commercialism. It's, it's, it's uh, transgressive. It has haunting, strange images. Um, and we sat down. And to my kids' credits, they sat down and watched all of Time Bandits with me. And it mm. was freaking amazing. It, uh, if, if you ain't seen Time Bandits, uh, it, it, it does. It's very much of its time. It's like, what, 1980 or 1982? 81? So it's, it's going to be a little slow by, by modern standards. But my goodness, the imagery they put together uh, is extraordinary. So, so good. David Warner as evil is uh, I, as iconic a performance as I could ever hope to see. Um, and uh, what's funny is Penny, you know, she's 15. And halfway through the movie, she goes, <sighs> This almost feels like a Monty Python thing. And I was like, <laughs> funny you should mention that, kiddo. Oh, <laughs> it is? I, I, well, it, John Cleese is in it. It's directed by Terry Gilliam. It's oh. not, not entirely 100% pure uh, uh, Monty Python, but it, you could tell that DNA is strong in there. Well, and but that was, that was always the, the fascinating part about Monty Python is that they had such strong directorial styles uh, and that the, the Gilliam stuff kind of very much felt like Gilliam and, and the Gilliam solo work feels like extended versions of the Python stuff that he directed. Yeah, it, it gives me hope that I can show her Brazil next. Maybe not the 11 year old, but definitely the 15 year old. Yeah, uh, Time Bandits is a much more fun watch than Brazil, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you, have you heard the good news, brother, about Time Bandits? Uh, uh, me? Oh, 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 I, I, I saw some chatter that they're developing it into a TV show, which I have very conflicted feelings about. Well,. Two things will be it's supposed to be on Apple too. Do you know who's writing and directing it? Mm, Terry Gilliam? Taika Watiti. Oh, I'm in. Oh, All in. Oh. All in. All in. Oh, and, and by the way, there's a, we're looking at a scene right now of the the gang taking a photo and Penny, man, my 15-year-old, the moment that happens, she goes I bet that photo of them holding the map turns out to be important later in this movie. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, uh, the 80s was about like Chekhov's Polaroid, you know, like uh, Back to the Future and whatnot. Whenever you took the photo of something, it turned out to save the day later. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, a pick. I got to pick. Go ahead. Uh, I watched this over the weekend. I I I did not even, I did not know what I was walking into uh, watching this. Um, it was not until I was a good way into the into the movie that I realized what kind of was going on um but uh, netflix has a new biopic out now called extremely wicked shockingly evil and vile 
the Ted Bundy story um, as told by the perspective of his girlfriend at the time. And uh, it's it's. It's a, it's pretty good. It's I did not know the uh, the the sort of media uh, implications of the Ted Bundy trial at the time. This is the the late seventies, uh, one of the first, maybe the first court case uh, televised, if if if, uh, if that's right. Um, and uh, I I I enjoyed it. I I thought it was an interesting way to sort of tell that story. I think as someone who I, I doesn't know a whole lot about the Ted Bundy case. Uh, the movie definitely spends a lot of time giving you a lot of ambiguity whether or not this man did it, and uh, <laughs> I feel like that probably is is maybe I don't know. Uh, it probably should have been a little more overwhelming. Well, uh, I in the, in the fa- I, I'm 30 minutes into it, yeah, and, and I find it a bit uneven. But there's a bunch of there's a bunch of other Ted, but there's the Ted Bundy tapes and other stuff on Netflix and all that. I think the goal from here is her point of view she doesn't know you know is that mm-hmm. is that is that you know that, that we're not getting you know you, we cut away to his point of view and stuff because she's not doing anything interesting right. um in this way the movie's told but it's the idea is from her point of view is what does she know all she knows these things are being said about her you know this you know the man she loves mm-hmm. so i think that's part of the point of view is that uncertainty until we all know everything yeah i i, I guess that's a good point for that but it also does make a weird device of of for a lot of that film it's a lot of cutaways back to 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 his girlfriend liz just sitting on the couch and not picking up the yep. phone um and so that that stuff does feel a little weird but i i think it was it was interesting zach efron plays ted bundy uh and he does a, a pretty good job of it Haley joel osmond's in it he's a, yeah. a a secondary character uh but yeah pretty pretty interesting it, it kind of does make me want to check out the ted bundy tapes uh, yeah, the, th- those are uneven, but yeah. it's they're still. And the thing that got to me, the, the thing that drove me nuts when I was watching this, is they show that the the home video stuff of them, you know, him with her and the kid, her kid, and all that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, who's holding the camera? And it's like we keep getting these like these home these home it's like home film, not home movies, not home video, home movies. Right. I'm like, there's and like sometimes somebody smile at the camera, and then you see it, he's standing next. To him, I'm like, what? what where? Who is this stranger taking these? Yeah, it's a small little detail, but it's sort of part of the problem from everything forward. Is sort of like whose my whose point of view is this from? Mm-mm-mm. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I uh, I, I had a, had a good time watching. This. I feel like I learned a little more about that case, uh, yep. having watched it. So, extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile. <laughs> Uh, my pick is, uh, I've picked this before, but I'm going to reinforce it because they usually, they end up always surprising me with the good stuff. And that is, uh, Canopy, K-A-N-O-P-Y. And then the other one is Hoopla, H-O-O-P-L-A, which with many public library systems, these are services that you get for free that have movies and audio books and other stuff on there. And I'm surprised by the selection. Sometimes I'll go look on, let's say, Canopy, and I'll see, you know, movies that aren't available on Netflix that are, you know, available for pay other places that aren't on HBO and like new and recent movies. It's not a huge selection, but I've, I've number of times I found stuff there that came there is one of the early release windows, and it's free. And what's interesting is if you, let's say, have an Apple TV, it will not search it. Like Apple TV will tell you what's on Netflix and HBO. It won't tell you what's in those services, hmm. but you can go in there and then sell. And I've, I've often, very often found things that like I was about to go buy in iTunes. Yeah. Nice. Double free. So again, it's a really good pick if you want to, you know, have more content. And are both of these ones that you use your uh, public library card for or just who? Yeah. Yeah. I, so like with uh, all Los Angeles public library card, I'm able to use both of them and access the content. Nice. Which again, let me reinforce lynda.com L Y N D a many library systems have agreements with that a lot of great tutorials, a lot of great stuff. You know, I'm in the middle of a big coding project and you know, I, a lot of what I do, I learned from Linda, a lot of other stuff from Udemy, you know, paying 10 bucks for courses and stuff. And then the stuff, the whole back end infrastructure is built on top of like right now I'm using Google Cloud for free. It is amazing what you can do today for like no money. Wow. Very cool. so, what a world. Too bad it's all fake. I just hope the robots like us and vote <laughs> us up. <laughs> We're going to find out uh, uh, whether or not uh, uh, the sun explodes in an orange hue or a greenish one. 
<laughs> it's literally it's there's the joke about like how did the Titanic sink all of the time travelers who showed up to watch it sink or <laughs> and it's like one day we're gonna see these people in, in futuristic jumpsuits you know stand just appearing out of nowhere staring up at the sky and we're like well, what's going on <laughs> the supernova is about to happen uh, they're like what? Shut, shut up do you realize how long this render took we finally get to see it <laughs> stop ruining it in pc <laughs> it's been weird beer beat all righty yeah we may have to restart your call andrew um all right. Yeah. Bye. All right. Cool. All right. I'm going to check on kiddos. Uh, sure. I think it's just Penny in the house, but let me check. Okay. Hey, Justin. Hey, Bryce. How's it going, man? How are you? I'm doing good. I um, I played a new game over the weekend. What'd you play, dog? Uh, it was this, it's this little indie game. It was only $5, but I started playing it and immediately spent like two or three hours lost with it. Uh, called Islanders. Have you heard of this? No. It's a it's a very basic city building game. You get islands in you know in the middle of, of, of this body of water, and you place down all you place down buildings to build out like a, an island, a, an island civilization. And each you know they they respond to different things, right? So. Uh, you know the woodcutters get points from being near near trees, and then uh, the the buzz mill gets gets points from being near the woodcutters, and then the houses get points from being near uh, work and stuff. And it escalates and escalates, but it's it's interesting because it almost plays like a mobile phone game in terms of like you actually oh, really? you you score points as you're playing placing buildings, and uh, you keep hitting these like. Um, like these benchmarks, like these score benchmarks, and that's what gives you new buildings. Is like, okay, now I can hit this button, and you can. They give you like options, like, oh, you can do, um, like, brick laying, or you can do city life, and that determines what gotcha. what buildings you get. And as you keep playing through the islands, or as you keep playing through an island, once you get to a certain point, you unlock the next island. Um, and so you can keep playing, or you can just jump onto the next one. And your score is persistent, and it keeps going until you run out of buildings um, to place. It, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you are like it, it. It's not a like watch this thing forever. You are like constantly building and building and building until you run out of steam. Right. Right. Um, it's 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 really cool and very. Um, uh, it, it takes a it takes a little while to sort of get into the groove of like okay, here's how I should cluster things. Here's how I shouldn't cluster things. But like uh, by that second hour, I was I was feeling like oh I really like have a handle on this. Um, you know what this is yeah right. And for like a literally like a five dollar game, uh, it was better than any of the other like city building games I was looking at Sunday night. Oh okay. yeah. Um, it's very cool. I'm surprised it's not already. A, it may, it may be, there isn't like a mobile version, but this would be a really good like iPad game, I think. Um, with like touch controls. Hey, Andrew, welcome back. Hello. Hey, there are those frames. Oh, let me get you back on the screen. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was great. And then, uh, <laughs> I fell into it because I was, I've been playing Factorio more and I'm getting to this really complicated point in the game where you have to keep, I don't know, expanding your factory uh, and like doing more and more bigger, bigger processes. And it was it was so intimidating that I just I wanted to find a simple city building game. And, and this really was it. So. Dude, awesome. Yeah. Highlanders. Uh, all right. I'm going to use the bathroom up here. Sure. How was your weekend, Andrew? Good weekend? <laughs> Good. Yeah, I've been, you know, that, that software project I sent you, the video of, I've been oh, sure. just working on that, um, improving that, getting that, you know, better. Uh, nice. So, you know, making it, trying to make it super user friendly and stuff, make it super easy to add audio, you know, just click and drop audio tags in. Yeah. And stuff. Very cool. And working on the, the server side of it and speeding things up. So. Mm -mm. Check. I don't think we've got uh, an F 
for things question lately. For those of you in the chat room, I'm working on a project to make it easier to use uh, computer-generated voices to do audiobooks, but in a way that allows you to have multiple voices, background music, all sorts of other stuff. And so it's basically like, kind of like a, a word processor interface where you just paste text from a book and it automatically figures out who's speaking and whatnot, and then you choose the voices. Nice. So, you know, a work in progress, but... Awesome. Um, when you listen to stuff like with the background, it's really, you know, like the, you know, the voices have gotten better over time and they're, you know, not too far away from being, I think, as good as with your, I think, you know, I think we're a year or two away from computer generated voices being as good as your average audible narrator. Oh, I bet. Yeah. You know, I mean, and that comes down to just, you know, you training, you know, massive amounts of data and training voices to sound well. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, I, I think. You know, you look at like how um, functional something like Vocaloid is and how you could pretty easily, you know, make that interface better, easier to use. Um, Which one is this? Vocaloid, the uh, Hatsune Miku uh, singer software. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, 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 yeah. Like, I so, think it would be pretty, it, it, it would be, it, uh, it would probably, it would be certainly easier to use than Hatsune Miku, but if you gave it like a block of text and say, hey, you know, this is scary text, and this is a character voice, and uh, this is, you know, rising tension, and this is the big suspense relief, you know? Um, yeah, I can play you play you a little audio if you want to hear, like, what it sounds like right now. Let me sure. Just turn up. This is... It's going to try not to overblow you, but... By Andrew Lane. Oh, hold on. Try this again. Reload. See if I was doing something. Audiomatic presents The Keyhole by Andrew Main. Amy and her sister walked down the dark hall, afraid of what they were going to find behind the large red door at the very end. Why can't we go back? Asked Stephanie. I have to know what's down there. This may be our only chance to find out. Amy replied under her breath. As they drew closer, the frigid wind that constantly blew from under the gap below the... Anyhow, a little yeah. example. That, that took 30 seconds to create from pasting in just a sample chapter mm -hmm. into the, the thing and then just say, add, add music, add wind here, add footsteps here, click, add a music, music background, and then create. It's almost That's... like, you know, at, at that point, like, you know, I guess if you already have a book and you're looking for, for narration and sound effects, but... It's also just like an engine to make like an audio drama, right? Like you could, yeah. you could cut out a That's... lot of that descriptive text or replace it with sound effects or other production bits. Well, so yeah, exactly. What I wanted was one is because I have a lot of content I'll never pay to have created into an audio because it'd be too expensive, but it would be good enough, you know, as that. Mm -hmm. That was step one. The other thing is, and and what you can do is you can copy paste a script straight into here. And it will format it. It will automatically let you choose speakers for each part of it, right. and then you can have the descriptive text. Then you can put sound effects. So okay. you could create, you could write an audio drama straight in here. So I made it so it accepts script format, and whatever. So. Very cool. Uh, Artie, you guys good for after things? Yep. Do you do you have a to go get the kids at forty five? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> uh, uh, closer to forty, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Alrighty. Well, then uh, if you guys are good to go for after things, take it away in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello! Mr. Brian Brushwood. Ahoy! Bryce Castillo. <laughs> Even with our ghost theme this week. Hi, everybody. So, uh, let's talk about After Things, guys. Um... Which Game of Thrones? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna jump spoiler? right on in, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, here's the thing: we 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 only have two more episodes to hmm. talk about. Oh, you see, you see what was on Game of Thrones last night? I know, and that's. Uh, I mean, can we dive right in uh, uh, to the, the the criticism that? Andrew had 
uh, I, 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 I am forgiving of it because I, I just, I, I just, I like him so much. I just don't want him to go away. You know, you, you, so you have the, 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 the abandoned child syndrome. Oh, you know, I'll tell you what, it's, it's inbred within me and boy, do I, I just, all right, well here, I guess it doesn't make sense unless you, unless you go ahead and uh, give your, your, your two cents first, Andrew. So you go ahead. I, I enjoyed last night's episode, but here's here's the danger of expectations. We were told, you know, season six, it's going to be like six movies, six movies. I'm like, great. I, you know, I love the idea that we're going to get these moving sort of thing, keep moving the story, for, story forward, forward. Episode one, the season was like, I can table setting. All right, remind us who they are, the sticks. It's good. Episode two, we're going to get our big battle. Oh, no, it's the night before the battle. Good episode. Really good episode. Had this been in season six, season five, it'd be really, really cool. Here I'm like, wow, it's a lot of, okay. Then we get this, the episode three. I loved I loved episode three, partially because my TV is adjusted. I watched it at great conditions. I used the, the Amazon Prime HBO signal, which is 10 megabit per second, versus the other garbage five megabit second, the ones that people got stuck with. Enjoyed it, really, really liked it. It was cool. And then it's like, all right. And then I'm like, cool, yeah, three more episodes. And then then and then it's like, hey, last night's episode. Like uh, what happened was good. It was a really good 30 minutes. But it was 80 minutes. And I felt like, man, you guys only got two more episodes to go. And I'm now I'm worried that that we did you did we i was because i was last week i was defending like no no they got more episodes like they didn't they didn't shoot everything they didn't blow off all the fireworks on the episode three don't worry and then i'm like oh maybe 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 it is just going to be about you know you know who's worse cersei or daenerys and what's going to happen so yeah i mean that 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 is that is the, the conflict is about who sits on the on the iron throne or will there be an iron throne or yeah, I guess if, if there is a thing to to sit on at, at the end. But Brian, you go ahead. Well, uh, let me let me offer two contradictory thoughts. Number one, I liked this week's episode more than I liked the Battle of Winterfell because co-signed, co-signed, co-signed. co-signed. Uh, oh, oh, okay, co-signed. so Bryce plus is on one. the same team. Absolute plus one on this one, yeah. Uh, uh, because it reminded us what is great. Uh, it, it's back to form. It's it's this is what the show has always been is chess. It's been the greatest chess match in the history of television. And for a brief moment, uh, we just saw a bunch of and I guess you know keeping with the metaphor of chess, there are times that everybody's you know uh, threatening each other, and then there's a, a, a brief moment where. Somebody makes a move and all the pieces take each other out. That's what we saw last week. Uh, that's not necessarily the most interesting part of chess, but it is an important part. It's a fine, you know, exciting moment. But now we're back to playing chess. And uh, to my surprise, they're making uh, the shocking assertion that maybe Daenerys isn't right for the throne. And maybe she's a little bit too power hungry. And maybe she's a little bit too much like Cersei and all that stuff. Now, having said all that, or her crazy father. Uh, 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 correct, yes. Uh, having said all of that, the episode did feel astonishingly small. Like they show up at, at, at King's Landing with, I don't know, a few dozen guys. <laughs> they talk a bit. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, it, I mean, it, that, that, it was felt... four, that was for a parlay. I understand. Like that, I, I, yeah. I understand. I'm just talking about... Um, in terms of scope of visuals or whatever, like, uh, you know, the, the, the one dragon getting killed felt small and kind of unearned on the part of uh, uh, whatever. What, what, was it Yono? Is that his name? Um, uh, it, it, uh, Euron. Uh, Euron. 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 Uh, you know, Missandry getting kidnapped felt kind of unearned, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it, it felt small. So I understand why somebody wouldn't like it. But on balance, it was a return to form for the things that I liked most about it, and a reminder that uh, there are still many twists and turns waiting for us. And and seeing our our great invading army reduced to a dragon, <laughs> and and a a uh, 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 power hungry uh, 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 Targaryen um, I, I, it has me guessing now and that's one of the things that uh, that I love most is not knowing what's going to happen alright so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back so wait, like, wait, wait, wait can we get Justin's take first no 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 please Justin <laughs> no go ahead Andrew. go ahead 
is it my 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 guess my issue is like Dana the Daenerys might be bad. Yeah, when she incinerated Samuel Tarley's, you know, family, like right there because they because out of ego. I'm like that that die was cast last season. I'm like, she's gonna probably become the main villain. I'm like, she's gonna be that's gonna be the big thing about her, she becoming the villain of the piece. So I've just been waiting for that to un unspool and finally we're getting to it. And I'm like, well, yeah, we were there last season. Then like my guess for like you talk about it's like a chess game, it's like well, hey, we're going to show up to parlay with Cersei because, you know, she's honorable and she doesn't break her word. I'm like, why are you even doing this? Unless something horrible is going to happen. Something horrible always happens when you do this. So, Yeah, the, I, I uh, and I was uh, stupid enough to post on that stupid Game of Thrones subreddit. And so my phone has just been going off with the, the dumbest opinions on the Internet. Uh, <laughs> what did but, you post? What did you post? Uh, basically, j just I thought that the parlay at the end i was surprised when i saw it because i initially thought that 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 a message like that could be delivered via raven or be a via messenger or something like that that you didn't have to have the parlay there and it should have at least been reinforced with the idea of like denary saying no like i demand to go there and have this and my presence there to uh you know because they're there to win the hearts and minds of the people of king's landing if the people of king's landing specifically inside the red keep now stage a riot to get cersei out then everything goes a lot faster and cleaner than it would be if they have to storm through people that are defending it her last dragon is in range of the crossbows so all right then there's the idea of the 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 i i i don't know whether or not it was just bad uh, staging that the dragon is far away. I, 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 in rationalizing it in my head, is like, okay, did they mean to show that the distance between the the company, the Unsullied, and uh, uh, you know, Daenerys and Grey Worm uh, was outside of the range of the large cro of the uh, uh, bow and arrow stuff, and then that the dragon was outside of the range of the crossbows which is like weird because we don't really get a ton of like super big perspective stuff when the the Rhaegal gets shot down in the sea uh but i assumed i, I just I, I wrote that off as like okay so this is the reason why Tyrion going forward is basically like one half him offering like the the possibility of martyrdom because now he's walking in range of the bow and arrows. Uh, anyway, so I'm fighting with idiots on the internet about the stupid parlay and they never it's post on the internet. It's always a bad idea. So uh, in terms of the show, though, look, man, two and a half hours of Tyrion and, and Varys talking. I just, I just love it. I just love it so much. I just like it's just, they're and, just and, talking and they're trying to figure stuff out and they're like puzzling things out. And like there's even more like Vars like I've always done things for the realm. Listen, you dummy, you ball, you cue ball. You you've jumped side so many times that, you know, you made so many moral equivalencies. You have made it very, very clear that you have always just found the larger boat, of course, in search of eventually doing something great for the realm. But you've certainly hopped sides enough times and you've just always read the the you know you, you put your ear to the ground and knew where the buffalo were hurting um i don't know i just i, I liked uh uh you know the the, the Rhaegal stuff and and the euron's fleet stuff uh, to me felt a little like all right we got to make sure that this is a, a an evened up kind of fight by the end of it uh but in general the emotional moments mattered to me. I cared about them. I like these characters. Yes, more could have happened. We could have sped further along, but uh, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go so far as Brian and Bryce saying that this was something that I enjoyed more mm -hmm. because to me, these are this is the one-two punch of Game of Thrones. Is that it has the like super uh, uh well okay but if we put this person there and i'll whisper this person in this person's ear because i'm going to think that they're going to eventually feel greed and they're going to want this uh along with the like cinematic level insane battles where then everything kind of collapses onto itself and also this was the first time really since he was deposed his hand in king's landing that Tyrion gets to do high level Westerosi uh, uh, politicking. 
which is something that was one of my favorite parts of the show. And I kind of felt like the show had really been missing since he was deposed. And then he has to find his way all the way to uh, uh, Essos. And then even when he takes over his Danny's hand, they're not his strong suits. He's not like it's like his strong suit is like, well, I know that this person that their son is a tailor. So let's make sure that we make him the King Taylor. And that way we'll secure these lands and yada, yada, yada. And that's why this is what I really got into the fight with on the internet with the, with the parlay thing is that for Cersei, yes, she could go and attack them. Uh, if she fails to kill the people that she needs to kill, if she fails to kill the dragon, if she fails to kill Cersei, then now she has shown herself as weak for the remaining houses that do stand at her stead without the without the rest of the seven kingdoms or at least the seven kingdoms that she has in her possession she has very little army and she has no economy going forward like it like it, it is a matter of time via siege that she is uh, uh that somebody sells her out and and we are we are done with all this so i i got it although i just i wish they would have made it more of a uh, an active choice by by Danny to spell out like no we shouldn't just like we could send a raven saying, hey, surrender, because we know you're going to say no. I want to make sure that the people see that I am coming out over to uh, take her into custody. We uh, we did see an awful lot of characters collapse into one dimensionality in this episode, uh, starting with Gendry, who's like, uh, I'm a lord now and I'm in love with you. Marry me? No. Oh, and then we see it with Jamie. It's like, uh, ah, psych, I was always damned. Uh, get bent, giant lady. And then off he runs. And then uh, and then Braun shows up uh, slightly whiplash like, yeah, I could kill you. And maybe I will. Maybe I won't uh, get ready to be killed or not be killed. Bye. <laughs> like it was, it was. I like Jamie, bit. Jamie's had facets to it, right? Like, well, because we also don't know why he's going down there, right? He, he's, he's yeah, right. He is, he has said, "Hey, I'm hateful, and so is she." But we don't know whether or not that's like I must die by her side, or like I need to stab her in the face. I think, uh, yeah, he's definitely going to go to kill her, but he can't tell Brienne that, otherwise she would go with him, and he likes her. And but but also it was a good reminder that oh this character that we slowly have come to be on the side of over the course of eight seasons was damned in the very first episode and mm -hmm. and it was a reminder that it's like oh wait no we can't really like Jamie because he definitely is a genuinely bad person and as such or the fact that we only like him when he is actively doing things right like, right like he has to actively be heroic for us to care or else. We'll like the the balance will always be in favor of some awful things, uh, uh that he has done in the past. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know the 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 brawn of, of of the Blackwater thing. I, I I read a little bit more as like, all right, look, this is me playing both sides. Congratulations, I'm playing both sides. Uh, uh so whoever wins, I win. I'm a guy uh, very much like Tyrion, like trying to find whatever edges he can to exploit them and lean on them and uh, uh, then then be elevated by it. Uh, as for the Gendry thing, I don't know. I mean, like, he, th this has been kind of the the arc that really Arya wanted, you know, when, when they part ways, when he is going off with the uh, uh, Brotherhood Without Banners, she's, like, crying and, and, like, asking, like, oh, you know, I could be your family. And this is her getting everything that she wanted, only to find an Arya that is not the person that, you know, was was... Uh, left sure the um uh uh i'll tell you that conversation between varies and uh and Tyrion was positively electric where they explain in cautious detail to the audience that there's no pure answer to this and and we've spent a few seasons thinking oh it's going to lead up to Jon snow and daenerys taking over the throne but then like they did a great job last night of convincing me that it's like that is so problematic in so many different ways and can't possibly happen. So now that I know that, what is the solution that'll make me feel satisfied? And I, I, I can't think of one. I can't think of anyone, uh, including Tyrion and Sansa, because they did a great job of corrupting in this one episode, my opinion of Sansa. She's got so much little finger in her at this point that, that it makes me yeah. a little oogied out to imagine her on the And throne. also there's, there's, I don't know, there's some theories. There is good stuff on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 
I mean, and, John uh, John knew the ultimatum. He, I mean, da Danny laid it out in no uncertain terms. I just told you how there is peace in this throne. And the second he told his sisters... Might as well have issued a press release. Right. right. I, I did appreciate that moment. Well, and also, in, in the grand tradition of the Stark hero, right? Like, like the Stark hero goes to Cersei and says, Hey, I know you're screwing your uh, brother and that none of these kids are Robert. So you better step down, lady. <laughs> She's like, LOL, you're dead. Uh, uh, Rob Stark's like... Ah, man, I know I told you, Walter Frey, that I would marry your daughter, but, man, <laughs> I love this lady. <laughs> what a world, right? Oh, you're all dead. And now the final in the final episodes, uh, yet another needless secret revealed for the sake of honesty and truth and family. <laughs> oh, although I, I did Unless... deeply adore two things. One, that uh, that 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 it was unspoken, and he just goes to Bran and is like, "Bran, tell them." And then also that the camera cut away and spared us the tedium of the explanation. Like, we get it, we get it. They explained the thing to the people. Yeah. As also, your also just ate the fifty milligram edible, explaining the you know the plot of the Simpsons again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when did uh, when did is it is it Gilly? Uh, when did Gilly become so worldly and awesome and poised? Like she's all like, "Yes, I think we know how babies are made." I'm awesome and and well, going. she's once she got out of the north and traveled a bit and went to the citadel. That's how she became worldly and poised. Sure, sure, and and I City I Lennon. understand that in 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 the the theoretical. It's just we didn't see much of that becoming a lady in her. It's just like you know we kind of next time we see her, it's like oh look at you, you you've become a lady about town, haven't you? I didn't really read that as her becoming a lady. I thought it was more like stop embarrassing me. You're stammering. Well, but, like, but, but I, I, I guess I read that more as a strengthening of their relationship, that, that there was less of one of the each of them being in a strong position because either she was in the north pulling the scared Sam around or she was in the south and he was doing his best to keep her alive and, and uh, put her in good positions. And this at, at this moment, we see kind of a copacetic equal powered relationship between the two of them really for the first time. Which, which I guess we would expect from a mature and healthy relationship, which by the way, has me thinking that it's, there's a non-zero chance that uh, Samuel Tarly sits the throne. <laughs> um, but the, uh, 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 no, I, I, I enjoyed that representation. what did you think, Andrew? Uh, I'm just, you know, I, I guess I've said before, it's like, I would be okay with this episode if it wasn't like there's three episodes left and I just watched one, kind of catch everybody up on what's been the theme for for a long time which is daenerys is an awful person and she is an awful person and we're coming to collide with her and then it's like uh, now we get we're kind of getting to there and then then it's i don't know and then a certain this is like i think you know hey we're gonna go talk to cersei it's like this is always bad somebody dies it's always a bad thing to have happen and it's just i don't know i just was like I will defend their defense plans for Winterfell because I've heard a lot of criticisms that don't make much sense. I'm sure they're better strategies, but as far as like, yeah, we're going to show up with our one dragon here and whatever to go, go ask Cersei to test surrender. <laughs> it's like, well, but you, you, you didn't read that as, as I mean, it's, it's, they say at Dragonstone that this is a play for the hearts and minds of the people. Oh, yeah, but I understand that that the her yeah her the Daenerys is, and then when the world falls down on them, they'll know. I'm like, yeah, but th this is yeah. Send a friggin' raven, send an emissary, send somebody to go make a point of this. But it just to me, it just I don't know. I mean, I, the show gets criticized because of how quickly people move around now, like teleport from point to point, you know, and like next scene, what's probably should have been weeks has elapsed. Now they're here. To me, it was just. It was a thing a writer wrote because they wanted to have that scene, not because it yeah. made sense. That was that's how it felt to me. I mean, it definitely is. You get the cinematic moment of Danny looking at uh, uh, Miss Andrews' head getting cut off, and and uh, you know you get the 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 Dracari's moment. So I, I I totally can understand that, and at, at the very least, even if my my justifications are correct, they should have been more clearly spelled out to avoid the con to avoid people just thinking like did you just literally risk your entire 
military operation to hand like, a note. <laughs> yeah, to uh, and look because I can also buy the idea that like you know Tyrion goes and makes this move of like all right, well either Tyrion's going to speak his piece, uh, and by the way, part of his spoken piece is revealing that he knew that Cersei was pregnant before uh, she has told uh, uh, Euron Greyjoy. Which, by the way, the next person uh, who deals with uh, Cersei, make sure that your maester is Mori Povich to start doing these paternity <laughs> tests. Uh, because she has run this same scam <laughs> three times now. Uh, but uh, they're, like, so now there might be an, imp- there, there, there might be an, in- an information uh, uh, advantage gained there. Uh, and then if he gets gunned down, if he gets shot down by bows and arrows, then it's a, a moment of uh, a martyrdom for for the side. And if you are fighting for the hearts and minds of the people inside King's Landing, then, you know, a, a, a person without arms being shot down, you know, not the worst thing. There. I, I, I just... If it wasn't the Cersei we've seen, I mean, she blew up everybody in the Red Keep. She's murdered everybody there, and then it was like, and then I didn't need I mean, another. But, but, but she made that. She made that look like an accident. Like, like she still hasn't. She didn't say like, "Oh, this is a coup that I'm taking." This was, uh, oops, all these people I hated died, and and my son is going to now be the unquestioned ruler. But then he killed himself, and so now she takes uh, uh, yeah. the throne. And 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 the Red Wedding was something that was a, a reputation scarring event because it did break protocol. I guess my point, like with the red key, I kind of at that point, like she's, I'm dictator for life, no matter what you want, but also it's, it's kind of like another Tyrion speech to Cersei appealing to her better. And I'm like, really? Like, like we, we all know that ain't I, I, I will agree with you on that one. That, that felt a bit more like what you're supposed to be the smart one. What do you think is yeah. about to happen? Like, but it has been like, a long Lu- time. Lucy's never held the football for you. <laughs> Why are you still yeah. running towards it? it it's been yeah, a the, long time yeah, though, since I, he was I, at I, didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't read that as him thinking that anything was going to come of it. Sure. I, I read that as th- this is all theater before a very long siege. Like that's that was the idea before. Now maybe Daenerys jumps the line and decides she wants to burn everything. Uh, but the the point of Tyrion from the very beginning was this can't be a a hostile murder. So if we want the siege to go as fast as possible, then we need to grease the wheels. Yeah. Oh. Two episodes left. You guys are gonna have to do the well. I mean, I don't think we're gonna have a, a, a an episode because I'll be I'll be gone. Uh, right. We uh, won't have one for the final thing. for the final week. Just have to follow the twitters, I guess. Or court killers, court killers. We do. Yeah, man. Spoiler time. You should have uh, have Andrew on court killers. And you guys That'd can be cool. Have the, uh, the final the final countdown. Maybe yeah, we can. We, be, we, oh. we could do probably a bonus size roundtable, like immediate. Uh, maybe even schedule it after the show or something. I don't know. Maybe. Well, I don't know. We'll we'll figure something out. Yeah. Uh, I'll be in India during the final episode. Oh, oh yeah. right. Andrew, no, Andrew, he's Andrew, also going to be. Our, gonna be Holy cow! Uh, fun that's fact: right, right. my 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 gym trainer is also going to be in India during the the final episode. She she's uh, scheduled like she told me today. She was like, "Oh no, I got it all figured out. There's going to be a watch party. No idea if it'll be in English or what, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I'm excited." <laughs> uh, you guys want to jump to picks? Yeah, uh, I'm diving into, man, there was some podcast that I, that I really jumped into hardcore and I'm having a hard time accessing the name. I guess Here, I've um, got, I've got one okay, while, go while you're it. doing that. Um, I've got a pick. Uh, it's actually a pick that I'm stealing from Andrew, uh, because he recommended it a few weeks ago and I really like it. It's NPR's how I built this dog on it. That that's literally, uh, Oops. what I've been diving into. Oops. That's great. Yeah. Uh, it's great really cool. guys. Great. <laughs> I was listening to uh, the, I think it's the latest episode with John Foley, the guy from Peloton. That's the live one, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's very, it is it is genuinely uh, interesting to hear the story of these entrepreneurs and how they go from, you know, taking a chance and looking for investment and looking for partners and, and eventually growing it into these uh, success stories. <laughs> Though, I will say, listening to this Peloton one, um, it was 
it was it was just a it was a remi- it was a reminding moment a, a a a flag in the sand to remind us just kind of where some people uh you know get to benefit in life from certain things of him he's he's talking about you know he went to harvard business school and then he got out of school right when the market collapsed or the housing market collapsed and uh, was able to get a get a job uh, granted at a company he had worked at before city search uh because his brother is the ceo of ticketmaster and those two companies had merged that's a convenient uh it's a very convenient sort of and i i'm trying i don't hold it against him because uh, it but it's 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 just a reminder of like oh yeah you know sometimes it's more than just it's good ideas and I, good business i I, I heard the uh the same thing i, I think it was on pendulite's podcast he was talking about mm-hmm. sam harris uh the neuro neuroscientist and uh host of the uh uh what was it? It's no longer waking up, but whatever it is, uh, his podcast, apparently, uh, his family got all their money because they made the golden girls, which is why he was able to run around and, and, and meditate and do drugs in India and all that stuff. Uh, and like, look, if you have, if you have the option, I I, (laughs) I highly recommend it. (laughs) If that's the simulation you want to sign up for on your next lap, go for it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I just, it's just, it was just an interesting moment in a very, very interesting story of uh of um this you know home service bike biking content company um yeah uh, how i built this so uh i got a pick um oh, sure. oftentimes i'll listen to an audiobook or something to go to sleep and the problem is every so often the content is too compelling for me to quite drift off to sleep but my goodness have they figured out the exact right sweet spot it on the headspace app if you go there's a subcategory called sleep And some of them are guided meditations that are designed to let you fall asleep. You set it for five minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they also have these soundscapes where it's like you visit an imaginary place like, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, river, river land or or snow palace land or whatever. And um, it is like like sound effects. Correct. And and there's a slider bar for Mm -hmm. how much you want the talking and how much you want the environment. And uh, and then, you know, you. To be honest, I don't even know that you set a time limit on it, but it's just interesting enough that you don't feel that hollow loneliness of like, okay, I'm left alone with my thoughts. You feel like you're on a journey, Mm. but it's just boring enough that you never mind drifting right off to sleep. It is, Mm. it is, it is a potent, like if you're somebody like me who has a difficult time, a, 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 a tenuous relationship with sleep it's mm. extremely great like i can't think of a single time i've managed to stay awake through an entire one of those sleep uh sleepscape things yeah, very cool headspace very um, cool yeah. uh yeah go ahead andrew i don't know what oh I'm i got doing. nothing i got nothing <laughs> Game of I, don't what? I, I pick my friendship with andrew may <laughs> You should all try it. <laughs> <laughs> Highly recommended. Five yeah. stars. Two thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, it's been after. God dang it, right. All right, that's the show. Uh, we got to get, uh, we got to hustle just a little bit. We've got Cord Killers coming up, and we're starting a little early. We're going to have Chuck Wendig on. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, he's going to be on and, and, and talk with us. So that'll be coming up in a few hours. Uh, Justin, you got any streams coming up? Nope. Uh, done for today, but tomorrow we are back, uh, with, uh, Jury Daily. And then, uh, yeah. Very it's, cool. It's pretty much it. Andrew, any live streams people should expect? Um, no. No? No. No. I'm gonna go back into my little bubble for the next week working on my project and then go to India, try to write a book while I'm there, and then... Mm, mm, mm. Right on. Dude, thank you to everybody who joined us live. Yeah, thank you guys for watching. We'll be back in a few hours with Cord Killers and Spoiler in Time. Here's us talk more about the Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Turns out it's a news. thing. A lot of people want to talk about oh, it. No, that's a Tom Merritt's podcast with Molly Wood. Yeah, that's a different show. Oh, you Absolutely. know, there's something you said about the whole economy of when you have popular culture that's popular, that you have all these spinoff things like podcasts and the ability to talk about that, like what the value of us had. And what we lose when Game of Thrones is no longer there. Yeah. You know, it's, oh, yeah. It's not like something always fills that void. Yeah. Well, I think that's why you see fan casts pop up for everything nowadays, right? Like, like even something like Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul is a great show, but 
and uh, uh, it's not maybe the first one I would think of having a fan cast, but you know, that's there will always be people who want that, and that's that's a cool thing. Yeah. 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 All righty. Well, we'll see you guys in a few hours here for Court Gillies. Bye. XOXOXO. XO, XO.